All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Crime Loser. How you doing this morning? That's good. Okay, so as most of you probably heard, they did arrest two people in connection to Joshua Brown's murder. And people that are a little bit out of the loop, Amber Geiger was sentenced on Wednesday of last week, and then on Friday, the key witness that said that as he was walking down the hall, he heard her and uh, Bo surprise each other, and then he heard gunshots, but what he didn't hear is anyone say, show me your hands, or who are you, or is this my apartment, or why is the TV in a different spot, or many of the things that you would think that Amber Geiger possibly could have said. And so she was sentenced on Wednesday, and then two days later on Friday, he was found dead in a parking lot, and it of course, it was like, oh no, is this a retaliation thing or a revenge thing? And yesterday they arrested two people, they're looking for a third, and it's looking like a drug deal gone bad, which it's real sad either way that Joshua is dead, but it's a lot easier to wrap, at least for me, to wrap my head around just a drug deal that's gone bad than someone associated with the police killing him as revenge for testifying. That's corruption on a level that just would have been scary and sad for Dallas. So the information that's out so far is these people drove up, the three people drove up from Louisiana to buy drugs from Josh. And the they got into like an argument and Josh shot... Their story is that Josh shot one of them, and then they shot Josh back and killed him. And Joshua was in a a shooting-type altercation a year ago at a nightclub, and then he was scared to testify, I guess because he was a drug dealer, and live in that life. And um, he was scared to testify because you know, you're a drug dealer and it's not the safest route to go. And someone had posted on his social media when he was popped up as far as the trial goes, saying, now we know where to find you. And um, I was thinking, I wonder if it's okay in that community to snitch on a cop. It's like, sorry, bro, you get stitches, you snitch. But I snitched on the cop. You're like, all right, you get a pass. No stitches today. But um, pretty crazy, right? It's crazy that I was thinking last night, I wonder, so they're saying that it, they showed up from Louisiana just to buy drugs and then it went bad like in the moment. But I was thinking if they say they wanted to kill this guy, if they wanted to kill Joshua for a while and they were like, hmm, maybe we'll do it now. He had just testified on this cop. Maybe they'll think it's the cops. But it's also, I think, a really bad time to do it too because he's so faint. He's like nationally in the famous in the spotlight right now. And then if you, if you do kill him right now, of course, everybody's going to think possibly it's the cops, but that's going to make the cops only just look into it way more right because they don't they're like it wasn't us Fuck, i mean we didn't do this one so we'll definitely figure out and so yeah three people were arrested or two people were and they're looking for another one but what a crazy case right and i'm sure a lot of conspiracy theorists type people will still think it's the cops and just think that it's like they did it, and we're like, oh, just a drug deal gone bad, everybody. Nothing to see here. Let's keep it moving. But, you know, I don't know. Um, I've been thinking a lot more about the Alec Manassian case. That one's just nuts. How, if you don't know that one, it was a guy in Toronto that frequently meowed. So... He had some issues, and he didn't think he had any issues, at least in the inter in his interrogation. The interrogator was saying things like, you know, were you in... He was basically kind of trying to be gauge, like, do you know your special needs? I mean, you meow. That's 
Um, and it didn't seem like it didn't seem like he really knew or acknowledged that he was special needs and he just chalked it up as just being like a, a beta that was treated unfairly. And it was one part in the interrogation, I thought it was kind of funny, the interrogator, the interrogator said something about how he always he interrogates people with special needs and I never knew. Was that, is that a thing? Like, there's speci- I know there's specific interrogators for, like, sex crimes and murder, but is there... It's pretty specific. It's like, I am a special needs interrogator. But it would make sense. But the interrogator, in a way, to get Alec to just try to see that, you know, he has these issues, and maybe that's why all the Chads and Stacys have cast him into brutal loneliness. But the interrogator was like, (laughs) he was like, I've worked with special needs people for a long time. And there's, you know, I've done this job for a long time. And uh, uh, there's even people with special needs in my family. And uh, because of this, and it's funny because he's trying to say it in such a nice way, but there's really only one way to say it. He's basically saying, he's like, I've worked with special needs people for a long time and your special needs, buddy. But he was like, yeah, I even have them in my family and I've worked here for 20 years and I can, uh, and he like thinks about it for a second. He's like, I can tell when someone has special needs. And, um, and then it go and someone had said on my last video when I was talking about him that you know tons of women can't get laid either and they don't go on this violent and there's also tons of men that are don't excel in that department that don't also do a terrorist attack either and I think with Alec I think he had this rage in him that maybe even if he did get a girlfriend later on he still would have maybe done something because he loved, um, he said he pl- played violent video games his whole life in order to get the urges out, which goes completely against what the whole argument that's happening right now, that like we shouldn't have the Joker movie. There shouldn't be movies because they might. And if anything, he was saying that like the violent video games kept him from doing something earlier and then he wanted to join the army and be on the front line he wanted to like go straight into war so i don't know whatever is happening with alec manassian's head apart from the meowing and stuff i think there's some bad rage in there too but um it made me think of this story that one of my friends told me and i've thought about telling you guys this story for a few different times and I don't know it's just a pretty it's a dark story from all angles but I don't know it's a rainy October day and I figured it kind of relates to this case in a weird way the Alec Manassian case so I think you guys can handle it but like I said it's a sad one from all angles but so I met this guy maybe like six years ago and I played the same comedy club in Queens almost every night for a few years. And so I was always at this building and just usually hanging out. If it's nice weather, I would just be hanging, standing out on the sidewalk, either waiting to go on or after there'd be two shows a lot of nights. So just like killing time. And this guy lived in this building. And so, you know, at first he would walk by, Hey, how are you doing? We became friendly. And then we, just from seeing each other all the time, struck up a friendship and then would go and, you know, go grab dinner or something and really kind of became good friends. And uh, he ended up telling me this story one night about when he was a kid, his parents got divorced and his dad moved away and pretty quickly either remarried and there was kids there were stepkids and he pretty quickly like got into a new family and was just gone. And so my friend and his sister were still with the mom in that, in their house and slowly, but surely 
the mom started to get really mean and evil and and it was getting worse and they were both small kids but they they were they when they talked to the dad on the phone who's off with his new family doing his new thing doesn't want to hear any issues or problems doesn't want to deal with anything with the old family but they're telling the dad like mom is mom is like acting mean and crazy and we're scared and the dad said ah it's fine you know it's just mom she's fine she's going through stress you guys are okay you know it's just your mom cut her a break and uh and it kept getting worse and she got she was getting really mean and would scream and and then it progressed where she started to sexually abuse my friend, the guy that's telling me this story, really bad. I don't know what she did, but the way he explained it to me was she started doing things that only a girlfriend should do. And there's something just horrifying about a mom, just a mom turned hag abusing, and they're, the kids are just stuck with her in this house of terror, you know? And it's just, she's, you know... She would scream and just, what did I say? And just horror, the nightmare, total nightmare situation for these two kids, brother and sister. And, you know, my poor friend, he was getting the sexual side of the abuse and the sister was a little bit older and didn't know what to do and they're, you know, trying to get dad's help and nothing and and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, the mom dies. And in the autopsy, they open her head up and she had a big, giant brain tumor that had slowly grown and just made her mad. Just crazy. Can you believe that? That is, that is right out of a horror movie. And... And if you know anything about serial killers, a lot of times it's exactly this relationship that my friend had with their mom. It's like a horribly abusive, sexual, weirdo mom abusing a son. And then they end up hating women and taking out, you know, they're, they've been abused and it just goes. And so my friend, you know, he is really, for what he went through, is just... You know, I give him so much credit. He's so high functioning. He's very successful. He doesn't use it as a an excuse for anything or a crutch for anything. He goes to intense therapy every week. He just looks at it as, you know what? This was a part of my story that sucks. I have to work the rest of my life on it, but I'm not going to, you know, make any excuses for it or just shrivel up and, you know, disappear because of it. And uh, so why I told you that story is because he told me that, um, I guess I should say, so because of his relationship with his mom and even his dad, his dad was a nightmare too, he really has no want for like a family. He's had some girlfriends along the way, but it never goes well and... His mom just didn't give him too much of a chance to be successful in the whole, like, you know, relationship department. And he's known that. And he's got a great dog. And he, like I said, just chalks it up to everybody has things in life that happen. And, um, but in his, he's, I think, like, mid-40s now. But in his younger days, like 20s and 30s, there'd be times where he would go and get a prostitute, you know, and fulfill needs that way which is a whole nother discussion whether you think that's good or not but um and why i told you that is because so now years later i don't think he does it anymore but years later his neighbor contacted him and he's op he was open about it you know he's like this sometimes i would and so years later his neighbor across the hall who has a severely autistic brother is that how you say it? Severely autistic? Very, uh, I don't know, this way down the spectrum? Whatever it is, he has an autistic brother. And 
his neighbor with the autistic brother came to my friend and said, you know, uh, knew, knowing that my friend had done the whole like prostitute thing at times and said, you know, listen, my brother is uh, who you've met. He's never had a sexual experience before. It's starting to really kind of bum him out. I think his brother was getting like late 30s. It's something that, you know, he wasn't, and this is why I think Alec Manassian just had this rage of, you know, like murderous rage in him either way, because this autistic brother wasn't, man, it wasn't going to manifest itself in anything violent, but it was just bugging him and making him sad. He understood the world enough to know that it was very sad that he never had a sexual experience with a woman. And so the neighbor was saying, you know, do you think we could get him a prostitute just so he would have, you know, he could get past this and, you know, it's really bumming him out. And my friend was very understanding and said, yeah, oh yeah, let's, you know, let's do it. And so they explained to the brother the whole thing. And the brother's smart, like a lot of people with autism you know, so we totally got it, but they explained to him that, you know, it's not going to be like in the movies, you got, you guys aren't going to be in love, it's more of a business transaction, and if you feel awkward when you get there, you don't have to do it, and if you feel awkward while you're doing it, you can stop, and they explain this whole thing to him, and they say, you don't have to do it if you don't want to, and, you know, after explaining it, they said, is this something that you would want to do, and he was like, yes, definitely, he was really into it, and... So they, in the middle of the day, they drove him to, I don't know, I guess my friend knew like some good, safe place or I don't know. They drove him to this place, you know, it's New York City, I guess that a lot of cities you probably couldn't do this, but New York City, baby. So they drove him the middle of the day and they, um, they like walked him in and said, okay, we're going to wait out here in the car. And they're sitting out there in the car. And then after a time, he comes out and he's got this big smile on his face. He's like glowing. And he, uh, he gets in the car and, you know, they're like, so how was it? And with this big smile on his face, he goes, it was great. I licked her asshole. And they were just in the front seat, kind of looking, just like going, all right, all right, good, good for you, buddy. Like, I'm glad. And he just, he had a great experience, I guess. And it really helped him to just, I don't know, get that out of the way for himself. And so my friend is telling me that story. And I, I guess I'm naive. I always pictured the, John prostitute relationship pretty much like Pretty Woman where Richard Gere is giving her the credit card being like go buy yourself some a new wardrobe but sadly I think that it's more just a lot of guys with special needs and some problems getting out urges which is just pretty sad to think about so my friend tells me that story and I was like whoa that is crazy I would never even thought of that happened and he was and his response to that was like no nah, it's actually not crazy it's not the first it's not the first uh like family i've helped do that and he was saying he works in the medical field and he was saying that there was a, a woman doctor that did the same thing you know knew knew uh knew how hard that her son was with autism was going through it and contacted my friend somehow and said asked to do the exact same thing and my friend was saying it was almost funny like they're text he's texting with this doctor and you'd think they were texting and she's like are we gonna do it let's do it this next week and so i don't know i don't know how even what to how that relates to the whole story but it just made me the whole alec manassian thing and the beta uprising against the chads and the stacy's and just made me think of that story and like I said I don't think that if uh, Alex's parents did something like that I don't know if it even would have helped there was just that rage 
and that violence there. Either way, I think he was drawn to it. But anyway, on a rainy October morning, I'm signing off. Why, Stavin, why? Have a good day, everybody.